Hello and welcome to Crime Bites, the show where we talk about some truly bizarre and disturbing crime cases. My name is Liz and today is True Crime Tuesday. Today is going to be the first of seven episodes in our first ever, drum roll please, Sinful Summer Series. And we're going to pick one of the seven deadly sins, then talk about a crime committed because of said sin. And today we are going to focus on greed. And can I just say, I started looking for different motives after I picked a case for greed, and guess what? Of course, I'm finding a lot of cases that when you kind of start digging into the motive for whatever crime, you can say, hmm, that's greed. Be it Pastor Shin from 7M, here's looking at you, to any of those insurance fraud cases that we've covered, greed is high on the list for reasons why people commit despicable acts that they wouldn't normally commit. So today we are going to look at a case where greed literally destroyed a family in one of the worst ways that you could imagine or did it. That's what I originally thought when I picked this case, but I actually almost ended up pulling this one for this topic after diving a bit deeper, and I'll explain why as we get into it. I decided to keep it though, because even if greed wasn't the main motive behind today's crime, it was blamed as the motive. It is a factor in today's story, irregardless, and it also played a large role in the lives of our victims as well. There are two different ways that you could tell today's story, but where does the truth lie? The only people who truly know are sitting in prison right now, but that may change. So keep an open mind when we go over today's case. The main event that we will discuss happened in 1989, but new evidence has come out recently this past year, actually, that could change everything, and we'll talk about that as well. So let's get into it, and let's start by meeting Jose. Jose was born in Cuba, but his parents would send him to live with his cousin in Pennsylvania when he was 16 years old. This occurred in the 1950s as Cuba was going through the Cuban Revolution and embracing communism. So Jose went to America and ended up getting a scholarship for swimming at Southern Illinois University. It wasn't easy for him at first and he actually wasn't happy to leave his country. He didn't even speak English at first when he got here. He would meet his future wife, Mary Louise, who also went by Kitty while attending there. And the two would end up marrying and moving to New York in 1963. Kitty was attending Southern Illinois University for communications and caught Jose's eye when she won the Miss Oak Lawn beauty pageant. Each of their families would not approve of their marriage. His because she was a child that came from a divorced home, and hers because his family was Cuban. Nevertheless, the couple decided to elope to New York where Jose would briefly spend time washing dishes and living with his parents, who at that point had come up from Cuba, and then he would finish his degree and get his CPA license. Now, although Jose's family was somewhat wealthy in Cuba, they ended up losing a lot of their wealth during the Cuban Revolution. So at this point, he basically had to build himself up from scratch, which was exactly what he did. Straight out of college, he landed a job at a firm that did financial audits for companies where he would end up auditing a company in Chicago, and he ended up doing so well for the company that they offered him the job of comptroller. And that paid a bit more than he was making at the firm, so he went for it. He was an extremely shrewd businessman. This job was available because of his recommendation to fire the existing comptroller. 
Unfortunately, the company got bought out after Jose did help them regrow it for a few years and Jose got let go, but soon found a job with Hertz Rent-A-Car where he got a job as the director of operations and then he ended up working his way up to the head of U.S. operations. Although Kitty had wanted to get into broadcasting, she ended up becoming a teacher and she would leave that job when she gave birth to her first son, Joseph Lyle, who would go by Lyle on January 10th of 1968. After Lyle was born, the couple would move to New Jersey, and on November 27th of 1970, Kitty would give birth to a second son, who she would name Eric Galen. The boys would go attend Princeton Day School and would be very involved in sports. Jose would start them both off with swimming as it was his go-to sport. His mother was actually the first woman to be inducted into the Cuban Hall of Fame for winning five swimming gold medals. So the bar was set pretty high and that was basically the standard for the family. The boys would go from swimming to soccer and ultimately tennis. In 1980, Jose would end up changing jobs again. This time he got reassigned to the entertainment industry portion of RCA. He worked to turn it around but was unable to do so and in 1986 he took a job as the president of live entertainment in California at which point he and his family would move to Calabasas which is in the San Fernando Valley. Lyle would remain in New Jersey at this point as he was planning to attend Princeton College. So by all outward appearances, it looks like we have the perfect example of a perfect family living the American dream. That all would change on August 20th of 1989 when 911 would receive this phone call. Yes, please. Uh, What's the problem? What's the problem? What's the problem? I'm trying to kill my parents. Pardon me? <laughs> what? Who? Are they still there? Yeah. The people? Oh. No, no, no. <laughs> were they shot? Hey, man, too. Uh, were they shot? Yes. They were shot? Yes. and when they got to the home they would find Jose and Kitty dead in their living room or den. I don't know why I don't like the word den but that's where they found the boys parents and the boys would tell the police officers that they had gone out to the movies and when they came back they had found their parents like that. So in one day, Lyle and Eric lost their parents and it would turn out they were really unable to be much help in trying to think of who could have possibly wanted to harm their parents. I mean, Jose was kind of a ruthless businessman that ended up leaving his sons around $14 million. So it literally could have been anyone. We are going to backtrack for just a second to the year before their parents were murdered. That summer, Lyle and Eric got caught 
burglarizing the homes of their friends. They had amassed over $100,000 in jewelry as well as large amounts of cash. They were caught when police officers discovered some of the stolen property in Eric's trunk when he was pulled over for a traffic violation. The boys ended up receiving a community service and counseling sentence and it was at this time that they would start receiving therapy from Dr. Ozeal. Eric would reach out to the same therapist after their parents were murdered and this would end up being the key to solving the case because Eric would end up confessing to Dr. Ozeal that he and Lyle had shot their parents. All right, so my search history got a bit fun when trying to figure this part out, but Dr. Ozeal had his girlfriend spy on one of his sessions so that he could report the crime to law enforcement. In most states now, therapists have the duty to warn law enforcement if someone is intending to harm themselves or others, but as far as confessions, that varies from state to state apparently. I still don't have a complete grasp or understanding of why or how as each state has different guidelines for their therapists and laws obviously i feel like in this case how would that be considered privilege information maybe someone can explain that to me better in the comments if that's still allowed maybe it was just the time back then but it does seem like a confession could in therapy go down and not be reported in some states if I researched correctly. Anyhow, Dr. Ozeal was apparently threatened by Lyle, so he could have broken confidentiality based on that. But he chose to keep seeing the boys and planned to have his girlfriend tell law enforcement what she heard while he was treating them, which she did. I'm going to need to have my therapist explain this to me because I have questions. I'll let you guys know if I find out anything interesting. Anyhow, once the police had this confession, they were about to subpoena the tapes and the officers were basically able to hear the boys confess. Eric had told Dr. Ozeal that about a month prior, he and Lyle had watched a mini series together called the Billionaire Boys Club, where there were these teenagers who were going around killing people in their neighborhood, including their parents. The brothers decided to kill their parents after watching this miniseries, but why? They had, by all outward appearances, the perfect life, except for that beneath the surface, Jose was allegedly an abusive narcissist, and Kitty was a suicidal alcoholic. So everyone knows there is no perfect family, and sometimes the more a family is trying to put out that perfect look, the more imperfections, I guess you could call them, they could be trying to cover. And that is definitely what seems to have been going on here. Jose and Kitty did not have the perfect marriage or even a good one. Like I just said, Jose was definitely showing narcissistic tendencies and Kitty drank to deal with the life that she felt like she settled for. We'll start by talking a little about Kitty because in my opinion, she was the lesser of two evils and I don't want to speak ill of her as a victim, but in this case, she was a victim and allegedly also an abuser, and we do need to talk about that part as well. Jose was in charge of their family, but she was the main one at home raising the kids while he worked, and she would tell them that they ruined her life. She didn't do anything when their father started to abuse them sexually either. She allowed them to be victims the whole time and I don't understand that. If anyone has any insight to that as well, <laughs> I mean she was afraid of Jose and she loved him, but how could she let that happen? I simply cannot imagine knowing that was happening to my child and not doing something, but that's just me. Hopefully other people too. They would allege that Jose had abused them sexually. Lyle, from when he was 
aged six to eight, and Eric from aged six to when they shot their parents when he was 18. Jose would start this abuse by showing his son's videos that were beyond normal porn, if you will. And that's not even okay for young children, but the things that he would show them depicted scenes that were violent and showed things like gang rape. He would have them pose for photos and specifically photograph their genitals. Lyle would state in court that when he was six, his father would give him this sort of homeschool sex ed, if you will, and he would highlight in history books where soldiers would have sex before battle to bond and then he would rape his son. I won't go beyond that. It's out there if you want to look more into it. But this would continue until Lyle was eight. And then when Eric turned six, his dad would turn his attentions onto him. While he was grooming Lyle, he told him it was something that the men in their families did with their children. And when he grew up, he would do it with his son. So we can assume that his father did the same thing to him. And that's extremely sad as well, but it does not make it okay. And I feel like that's going to be the theme for today's case because we seem to be just seeing a lot of extremely abused people lashing out here. Jose would abuse his sons in basically every way imaginable, from physical to emotional to straight up controlling them and making them feel like they were never good enough. But the prosecution would allege that the boys were making all of that up, that they had killed their parents for their inheritance because they were afraid of being cut off. And Eric had said that to his therapist. But after looking over everything and really diving deep into this case, I think it was both. I think those boys looked like they had everything on the outside, but behind closed doors, they it appears they lived in a hell that was created by their parents, and specifically Jose. This case was huge because of all the factors at play, obviously. It was everywhere, and no one believed the Menendez brothers. SNL was even doing their skits about their court appearances, and let me see if I can find one. Let me ask you once again, <laughs> is it your testimony that you and your brother Eric in fact had nothing to do with the murder of your parents, Jose and Kitty Menendez? That's correct. Then can you tell the court who did murder your parents? Our other two brothers, Danny Menendez and Jose Menendez Jr. <laughs> Good evening, I'm Greg Jarrett for Court TV. It was a startling day of testimony at the trial of Lyle and Eric Menendez. After several weeks of presenting its case, the defense stunned the courtroom with the revelation that not only are there two other previously unknown Menendez brothers, Danny and Jose Jr., but that they in fact committed the murder with which Lyle and Eric are charged. Later this afternoon, younger brother Eric joined Lyle on the stand and in riveting testimony, they spoke of the secret existence of these two previously unknown Menendez brothers and the years of emotional abuse they suffered. Now, is it true your father never allowed your other two brothers, Danny and Jose Jr., out of the house? Yes. And that he never allowed them to go to school? Yes. yes. Never had them in family pictures or mentioned them to friends? Yes. yes. No driver's licenses, no birth certificates, no social security cards. My father said Danny and Jose Jr. didn't deserve to have any official records of their existence because they were weak and not good tennis players. So in other words, it was as if your father didn't want anyone to know your other brothers even existed. Yes. Yeah. Later, in surely the most dramatic moment of the trial, the defense called these newly discovered Menendez brothers, Danny and Jose Menendez Jr., to the stand. 
Would you state your names for the court record? Danny Menendez. Jose Menendez, Jr. And you are both sons of Jose and Kitty Menendez? Yes. Yes. And you are not Lyle and Eric Menendez pretending to be two different Menendez brothers? No, we, we are, are not. Even though you look remarkably like Eric and Lyle Menendez? Yes. yes. And this is the first time that anyone other than your dead parents and Eric and Lyle Menendez have ever seen you? Yes. And it is your testimony that it was you who killed your parents, Jose and Kitty Menendez, and not your brothers, Lyle and Eric Menendez, to whom you bear a striking resemblance? Yes. yes. And that you forced your two innocent brothers, Lyle and Eric Menendez, to confess to the murder? Yes. yes. <laughs> Later, Danny and Jose Menendez Jr. faced a tough cross-examination by the prosecution. Oh my gosh. Mike Myers, Rob Schneider. I can't. But yeah, that was the tone of America. And I'm slightly laughing a little. It's funny. They did a good job making it funny. When it's actually not funny at all, but I can't imagine SNL putting out a skit like that about a case like this today. Here's my thing though, they wouldn't be in that specific position if they didn't kill their parents. Let me expand on that, but first I do want to show an actual clip of the brothers in court talking about the abuse that they faced at the hands of their parents. Did you want to do this? At some point, did he do some other things to you? Yes. Did you ask him not to? Yes. How did you ask him not to? I just told him, I don't, I don't. I just told him that I didn't want to do this and that it hurt me. And he said that he didn't mean to hurt me. And he loved me. Was that important to you, that he loved you? Yes, very. But I still didn't want to do it. And this makes me feel a little sick for even chuckling slightly at the SNL skit because it's terrible to watch. It's terrible to watch them kind of reliving their pain and knowing that most of America, most of the world even, thought they were lying about it. That's just so sad. But it doesn't take away from the fact that they killed their parents. So on March 8th, Lyle would be arrested with his friends when he was leaving the mansion in his friend's Jeep. The officers would literally pull up fast and box in the Jeep, a blue sedan pulling up fast in the front, and his friend went to throw the Jeep in reverse, and he smashed into the van that pulled up behind him. The police ordered Lyle and his two friends to get out immediately. Eric was actually playing in a tennis match in Israel, and the police met him at the airport on March 11th. The district attorney would announce that the motive for the murder was greed. The boys would receive two trials. The first was a mistrial where there were two separate juries, one for each brother, but they heard the same case. The juries couldn't come to a decision on whether or not it was manslaughter or murder. 
The second trial would result in a conviction of first-degree murder, and the Menendez brothers would receive a life in prison without the possibility of parole sentence. Then last year, 2023, a couple of things happened that are being used to corroborate the Menendez's brothers' claims of abuse. The first is there was a letter that Eric wrote to a cousin that said something about the abuse that was not available for proof and therefore made the testimony about it questioned and not considered as seriously. But that cousin died this past year and his mother actually found the note from Eric in his belongings where Eric says he spends his nights afraid his dad will come into his room and that he can't tell anybody, even Lyle. Then Roy Roseo, who was a member of a band that Jose Menendez managed called Menudo, which that's a whole other interesting side piece of information, but the important piece from it is that he molested at least one of the group members and they came forward and gave a sworn affidavit about it this past year. So apparently when Lyle heard about all of this opening up, he literally cried. Can you imagine most of the world does not believe you and thinks you're just murdering for money? Granted, it's still not okay that they killed them. I feel like I need to keep saying that. But it's more understandable, I guess. It's easier to have some sort of empathy for the boys. And that's another thing. Everyone calls them boys. They were both technically men, but they had such a boy-like quality to them. It, it's nuts. Like, they were sheltered, even though they weren't really. I guess over-controlled, over-managed, they just didn't seem very adult, if that makes sense. Anyhow, in light of the new evidence, the brother's attorney filed a habeas petition in May of 2023, and the brothers are hoping to have their case retried. If this happens, their lawyer is going to try and get the sentence lowered to manslaughter with the lower prison terms that would go along with that. And if that happens, they're probably going to be released. What do you guys think about that? I almost think that sounds fair, but I'm not sure at the same time. As far as I know, as of filming this, the judge has not decided whether or not the evidence at hand is significant enough to retry the case. Remember, the abuse was presented during the original trials, so this would just serve as proof that it actually happened. I'm honestly conflicted on this one. Even though they did a horrible thing, it seemed to be motivated, in my opinion, by fear and greed. I lean more towards greed because there are many ways that they could have handled the situation. Obviously, not everybody who suffers unspeakable abuse at the hands of their parents goes on to kill them. It was the way that literally killed two birds with one stone for the boys, and I didn't mean for the bad pun there, but <laughs> it's really hard when literally everyone involved is both a victim and a perpetrator. Anyhow, I do think both motives were at play in this case. I don't know if the boys or men should be released at this point. We'll leave that to the judge, but I would love to hear your opinion. And that is going to do it for today. But as always, let's try to end today on a positive note. I couldn't really figure out what to make that positive note. And this one is going to be a bit conflicted as well, like the rest of today's episode. I giggled a little bit and felt bad at that SNL skit. Something that I'm pretty confident we wouldn't see today. And I think that is a positive thing. Along with that, we have the opportunity to re-examine these new pieces of evidence and possibly come up with a more positive outcome for these men who, yes, made a horrible decision, but I'll stop there because I still don't know what the answer is, but I see overall growth in this aspect anyhow because we've kind of declined somewhat in some ways as a society, but here we can see growth and I think that's good. I just do hope that if they ultimately do end up being released that it isn't a mistake. 
Anyhow, stay positive. Next week we're going to do anger. Unless the motive of the story I'm working on ends up being envy. Not quite positive yet. Right now I'm pegging it for anger, which is perfect because I'm kind of ready to rage. This one got me really mad. Anyhow, guys, have a fantastic week. Stay safe out there. Bye.